The Industrial Revolution of the 19th century mechanized the Western world, developed rapid travel and enabled communication across great distances. Human effort engaged in science and technology resulted in viable perceivable benefits. At the beginning of the 20th century, the collective conscience of society, government and academia pushed psychology away from abstract theories about thoughts and mind into the experimental realm of verifiable phenomena. Russian physiologist, psychologist, and physician Ivan Pavlov was investigating the gastric functioning of saliva glands in dogs when he noticed dogs salivated on the anticipation of eating before food actually reached their mouths. These psychic secretions led Pavlov to establish the basic laws of what he called conditional reflexes. Pavlov then rang bells or blew whistles prior to serving food and noted that dogs then salivated simply upon hearing the sound. Some behaviors learned, some behaviors not learned. For instance, if there's a red light that flashes and then uh, I get stimulated by an uh, electrode that shocks me, 
I don't have to learn to jerk my arm back. That's, that's inborn. That is an unconditioned response. I jerk my hand. And that is built into my system. Now then, if I have the light flash first and then the shock and jerk, pretty soon I'm going to build something onto the system. I then have associated the flashing light with the painful stimulus, so when I see the flashing light, I jerk. So we have behaviors built into the system, then we have behaviors from the environment that those behaviors modified from things that we learn in the environment. That's built onto the system. The work of Pavlov and others led to behaviorism, a psychological approach that scientifically investigates behavior without consideration of inner mental states. Behaviorism asserts that free will is an illusion and that all behavior is determined by a collaboration of genetic and environmental factors augmented through reinforcement or association. But you are the product of what? Genetics, environment, and experiences. So where in, in that particular universe you just described does free will fit in? If that's simply what you are the product of. Where is your choice point? Well, it's derived from those genes and experiences, and therefore, from that perspective, uh, free will doesn't really enter into the picture, does it? Dissatisfied with the progress of psychology based upon the study of consciousness, the mind, or mental problems, American behaviorist John Watson felt the study of human responses to stimuli was a more effective method of understanding the human being. He was reacting to a psychology that still had not been able to cut its ties with philosophy, a psychology that still relied heavily on a method of introspection, this looking inward. Watson uh, felt psychology was at best a marginal science, that it was never going to take its place among the natural sciences if it didn't uh, adhere to a more objective criterion. and. Uh, so he called for the study of behavior. He argued that uh, psychologists such as the structuralists, the functionalists, Edward Titchener, for example, or William James or James Roland Angel, others of that time, that they were deluding themselves to think that they were studying mental processes, that mental processes could not in fact be studied. And so some psychologists have talked about it as the time that psychology lost its mind. Uh, and so, while the behaviorist revolution was not a very immediate revolution, people didn't jump on Watson's bandwagon all at once. By the 1920s, he had, uh, he had won the, the war. And uh, American psychology, for about a 40-year, 50-year period thereafter, uh, was pretty strongly in his camp. Watson later left academia for Madison Avenue, joining the New York advertising agency J. Walter Thompson, where he was one of the first to employ psychological principles of behaviorism to sell products. When people think of behaviorism, they usually think of American psychologist Burris Frederick, a.k.a. B.F. Skinner. Skinner's operant conditioning studies and predicts behavior modification due to an organism's memory of desirable or undesirable consequences of their behavior. Reinforcing stimuli have the effect of increasing behavior, while aversive stimuli have the effect of decreasing behavior. The greater the consequence, the greater the change in behavior. Skinner studied rats and pigeons for one reason and one reason only, and that was to understand human behavior. It wasn't to learn about rat behavior or pigeon behavior. He studied what he thought were simpler systems, which he then could generalize to more complex human behavioral systems. And the advantage of using animals is that you could control their behavior in ways that uh, ethically you couldn't control human behavior. In the Berlin School, Kohler, Kafka, and Max Wertheimer were developing a holistic psychology where all elements of perception were unified in a global construct. Gestalt psychologists sought to isolate principles of perception into innate mental laws and that the healthy mind has the ability to self-organize. German psychologist Max Wertheimer developed visual aids to illustrate how the gestalt tendencies of the mind operated according to the law of closure, the law of similarity, the law of proximity, and what was called figure ground. There's something that becomes the focus of your attention, and, and that we call the figure, 
and whatever else is, is there then becomes ground against which that figure is imposed, but, but will not attract much of our attention. And the most famous example of that, uh, faces, vase, illusion as it's sometimes described. So if you see the white, let's say the faces are done in black, then the vase appears in the middle of the picture in white. And, and that means that the white is the figure and the black is ground. But if you see the blackest figure with the whitest background, then you see these two faces uh, facing each other. Uh, and, and it all depends on which one you focus on. After spending time working with brain-damaged soldiers from World War I, Kurt Goldstein saw the organism as a whole system that cannot be divided into organs or into the dichotomy of mind and body. Goldstein saw disease as a manifestation of state change between the organism and its environment, and that healing did not come through repair, but rather through adaptation. So the Gestalt figures are very interesting. Uh, they're doing their work in Germany. Uh, they run headlong into uh, Hitler's Germany, and uh, their field sort of deconstructs itself only to be reconstructed later in American psychology as sort of the fomenting force behind the cognitive psych movement that comes to the fore in the late 70s and early 80s. German psychologist Kurt Lewin is considered the founder of modern social psychology, a discipline he developed through empirical field research on group dynamics. Lewin studied social conditions and the forces that promoted or resisted change in groups ranging from unruly gangs to community leaders. Lewin was one of the first to identify the benefits of education and legislation to combat social ills, such as prejudice and discrimination. When the child is being raised and starts developing a sense of self in terms of their knowledge of self, the identity, the self-concept, there may not be much of a choice because a child is basically internalizing everything that that culture is teaching the child. It's a part of socialization. But as the child becomes an adolescent, one of the key areas in adolescence is ego identity. And it is at this point that we tend to question. We tend to question what our culture brings us, what our parents bring us, what society brings us, and we tend to formulate our own perspectives. Personality psychology studies the composite of psychological processes that make up an individual or personality. That unique collection of emotional thought and behavioral patterns consistent over time. People cannot have an absence of personality. We have different styles and different personalities, but we all have them. One of the things to think about, it's kind of a combination, our personality of early temperament plays a large component to it is that we come into the world with certain predispositions and sensitivities and vulnerabilities and then much of our personality develops really subsequent to that with the interactions with the environment and the kind of situations and stressors we find ourselves in. The word personality originates from the Latin persona which means mask and was a convention employed in ancient theater to represent or typify a character. I mean, if you go to different cultures, you see that they have characterizations for personality. So it's kind of a common, I guess, trait or need of people to categorize. And one of the ways they do that is by observing patterns and traits in combination. American psychologist Gordon Allport classified personality traits or dispositions into four groups. Central traits were basic to one's personality while secondary traits are more ancillary or peripheral. Common traits are those the individual shares with his culture, and cardinal traits are those which are strongly manifested and characteristic of the personality. Allport is largely responsible for what we would call the trait theory of personality, the belief that personality was some aggregate of traits and that we all have, would have these traits to some degree or another. For example, things like sense of humor, uh, might be an important trait in someone, but might be a very minor trait in someone else. Uh, generosity, uh, honesty, uh, creativity, all of these things might be considered elements of, of personality. Raymond Cattell describes 16 personality factors by which a person is rated according to his or her relative strength. A person's reasoning, for example, can range from abstract to concrete. A person's liveliness can range from serious and restrained 
to cheerful and spontaneous, or one's vigilance can be assessed as being trusting and unsuspecting on one extreme, to suspicious and skeptical on the other. As there are so-called normal personalities, there must be in psychology what is called abnormal personalities, or personality disorders. Yeah, the definition of a personality disorder is it's a maladaptive pattern that usually originates in childhood or adolescence. It's maladaptive in the sense that it interferes with social, occupational, or personal functioning. People with these kind of disorders often come into therapy when they have a loss or a situational thing occur in their life that causes a problem. Many of them may come in with anxiety and depression, and certain of them, when the anxiety and depression leaves, then they leave therapy. But really, with these people, they demonstrate long-term problems in interpersonal relationships where they keep repeating the same patterns. Bucking societal trends in pre-World War I Germany, Karen Hornet became a medical doctor and married a lawyer, who later went bust. After contemplating suicide, Hornet developed a complex theory of neuroses based on her own experience that identified neurotic needs and coping mechanisms. To Hornet, one's core being or self vacillates between a despised self comprised of one's failures and an ideal self comprised of what one thinks one should be but is not. In constant turmoil between these two impossible selves, the neurotic is thus alienated from the true self and prevented from actualizing its potential. People with disorders, depending on the personality disorder, are compensating for voids, emptiness. It's the way they regulate their self-esteem. For instance, in a psychopathic personality, somebody with this kind of builds themselves up by putting other people down. In the manipulative cycle, they manipulate someone and pull something over on someone, and this actually bolsters their grandiosity or their feelings of uniqueness and specialness in other people. And their ruthlessness comes from what's called a feeling of entitlement, that they deserve things that they haven't worked for. In order to diagnose psychological abnormality, psychologists have employed a variety of tools and techniques. The way people perceive things reflects on their personality, so that you gain greater insight into their personality as a result of what they perceive and how they perceive it and why they perceive it that way. When you get around to trying to get a deeper picture of the personality. And you want to get at their fantasies and their inner thoughts, the things they don't express so much socially. You have to have some other indirect approach. And that's where the Rorschach and the thematic apprecession test, these various projective techniques came into being in the 20s and 30s and were very popular. Son of an artist, Swiss psychiatrist Hermann Rorschach was called Kleck, or inkblot, as he made fanciful inkblots his art form. He found that schoolchildren perceived different things in the images, and later devised a standard set of ten blots he used as a projection technique with his patients. It's just a blot of ink, but yet, in terms of the testing of it, the psychologist would ask you, well, what do you see? You know, and then you say, well, I see a butterfly, or I see a bird, or I see a bat. Well, tell me more about that. Well, there's really nothing there. So whatever you are talking about, you are basically projecting that onto that picture because there's nothing there. Projection is a part of these things, but even further is what called a mechanism called projective identification. And this is best illustrated on the Rorschach test with the person that looks at one of the cards and says, it's a monster, it's a monster with a club and he's coming after me. Whereas in projection, we might just see an angry monster. That's putting our own aggression onto the card. With the example I gave, not only is the aggression put out there, but it comes back after the person. And that's what happens with people who do stalking behavior, sexual homicide perpetrators, and certain sudden murderers is they, get, they cannot detach from an individual, and it's projective identification. Healthy projection, if there is healthy projection, is you just put those unwanted characteristics in you onto the other person. You're critical. You're angry. You're bad. With projective identification, it's a much more fluid process that hooks the person into an interaction. You're sadistic, and then I smile when I say that to you. 
And what I've done is I've projected my sadism onto you, and if I get you to act out punitively, I've invited you into a cycle with me. When uh, the Nazis took over in Central Europe, a number of the Europeans that moved to the United States had been working with the Rorschach. I did some research and found that giving one response per card gave you the same results if you had enough cards as giving as many responses or as few responses as you want to a given card. And it became a better psychometric instrument by having 45 cards instead of 10 cards from the point of view of eliciting uh, fantasies and ideas from people that would be productive uh, in yielding scores that would be replicable that you could count on with high reliability. One of the first widespread applications of psychological and personality testing techniques was implemented by the United States Armed Forces in World Wars I and II. Psychological testing helped the military classify new recruits according to intelligence, aptitude, and ability. These tests and evaluations also enabled psychologists to screen out those who were unfit for the rigors of military wartime service. The invention and implementation of the atomic bomb during World War II had a profound effect on most all fields of human endeavor. No longer could people slumber in stolid acquiescence. With a single command, an airplane could deliver a bomb anywhere in the world and obliterate hundreds of thousands, if not millions, of human lives. The mental health needs generated, in part, I think, by World War II and then the subsequent Cold War. The anxiety that people felt about the uncertain nature of the world at this time the kind of new level of threat that people felt of uh, the late 40s and through the 1950s really created fertile ground for the growth of American psychotherapy. And psychologists had positioned themselves by that time to take advantage of that interest. The idea that one could go see a mental health professional popularized in films like Spellbound or even in a comedic way in Seven Year Itch uh, with Marilyn Monroe. Uh, it really caught on with the public. And, and remember, this is the time in which there's a growing feeling that religion as we know it is, is irrelevant. Time Magazine had a cover uh, in this period, God is Dead. Psychoanalytic ideas about dreams and Freudian slips. This is the period when Eric Erickson has his greatest influence as a public intellectual. The Eric Fromm is, is writing books that are, are major bestsellers in this time period, all infused with psychoanalytic ideas. Before he was a tune-in, turn-on, drop-out guru, Timothy Leary was, of course, a psychologist, and his work in interpersonal theory and therapy is still seminal work. Um, and so I think what, what Americans did is they began to turn toward uh, psychotherapists as their new kind of spiritual guides. Not that they would have phrased it that way, but I think if you look in hindsight, you can kind of see that. Humanistic psychology emerged in the 1950s as a dynamic empowering antidote to psychoanalysis and behaviorism, focusing not on how a human being is, but how a human being might be. The thrust of humanistic psychology is often summarized in five postulates. Human beings cannot be reduced to components. Human beings have in them a uniquely human context. Human consciousness includes an awareness of oneself in the context of other people. Human beings have choices and responsibilities. Human beings are intentional. They seek meaning, value, and creativity. You see the development of a truly American psychotherapy. Uh, by that I mean it is not a medical model like Freud's is a medical model. It's, uh, it doesn't rely upon interpretation of events in the past, but it's very present-oriented. It's in some ways a can-do, exemplified, I think, best by Carl Rogers and his client-centered therapy. Carl Rogers is thought by many to be the most influential psychologist in American history. Rogers felt that individuals were born with all the attributes necessary for a successful, productive life, but that we are thrown off course by influences in our environment. The goal is to get back to our real self and become a fully functioning human being with these qualities. Openness to experience, 
existential living in the here and now, organismic trusting of ourselves, experiential freedom of choices and acceptance of responsibility, and creativity, the natural thrust of a person to contribute to others in society. If you really look at uh, the roots of Carl Rogers' uh, theory and his therapy, they're very Judeo-Christian and, and they sound very much like, just using different language, what you might hear in a Sabbath school or in a Sunday school. And I think they, Americans really resonated with that. In his work with monkeys, American psychologist Abraham Maslow observed how some needs took precedent over others, such that thirst was more powerful than hunger in terms of immediate survival, and so forth. This led Maslow to develop his now famous hierarchy of needs that ranged from basic physiological needs at the bottom to the need for self-actualization, which comes only after other more basic needs have been met. The bottom of this pyramid has to hold up the entire pyramid, so you know the bottom has to be extremely strong. And as you go up the pyramid, each layer of the pyramid has to have a certain amount of strength to hold up what's on top of it. As you go higher and higher in terms of the needs, the needs get weaker. As you go lower and lower, the lower the need is, the stronger it is. So this means that if right now you're being biologically satisfied and you feel secure because you have a job and you know, you're loved by someone and you're giving love in return and then tomorrow you lose your job, the lower need is going to be strong and it's going to pull you down the pyramid and once again you're going to be focused in on satisfying this need before you can once again ascend to the top. The flowering of humanistic psychology in America included new age therapies such as Fritz Perl's Gestalt therapy developed at the Eastland Institute amid the San Francisco Bay Area Cultural Revolution of the 1960s with goals of peace, harmony, and self-realization. The self is simply his word, his metaphor, his symbol for that organizing developmental energy that's going on within all of us. It's digesting our food as we speak, it's growing our toenails, it's responding cognitively. The totality of the organic functioning of the person is what is meant by the self. So it's fair to think of the self as a kind of verb, not a noun. You don't see it on an MRI. The self is selfing. It's moving through us in developmental ways, trying to bring this organism into the fullest possible realization or actualization of its potential as possible. Viktor Frankl's logotherapy grew out of his experiences in the Nazi death camps, encapsulated in his widely read book, Man's Search for Meaning. Frankl uses the metaphor existential vacuum to represent the empty hole of meaninglessness we seek to fill with stuff that never seems to satisfy us. True meaning can only come, Frankl suggests, through experiential values, such as the love we feel towards another or through actively engaging in creativity, the ultimate goal being spiritual transcendence. As abstract expressionism in painting was trumped by the popular or pop art of Andy Warhol and others, American psychiatrist Eric Burns' Games People Play caught on with the public and was initially dismissed in many mainstream mental health circles as pop psychology. Burns' transactional analysis put a new spin on Freud's psychic states of ego, id, and superego involved in productive or unproductive social transactions or games. I'll tell you who I really like as far as therapy goes, if you've got like uh, problems making decisions and, and that type of thing. I really like Albert Ellis. He literally teaches people, number one, how their thinking is screwed up, and number two, he will help you structure your thinking so that it's more rational. Ellis called his technique rational emotive behavioral therapy. It begins with unconditional self-acceptance and stopping self-defeating beliefs which sustain neurosis. Rational emotive behavioral therapy is not unlike what has become to be known as cognitive therapy. We are all, all in service to certain energy-driven ideas or energy-driven experiences or energy-driven values. Many of them come from the culture, many of them come from the family of origin. And so cognitive therapy basically is trying to ask the question, 
what are the unconscious ideas that my life is in service to? Until I can make them conscious, then they will hold great sway in my life. Cognitive psychology is concerned with knowledge, the mental processes by which knowledge is obtained and stored, and the ways in which people construct their realities from this knowledge. How one knows the world depends on what you bring to the world to interpret it. Uh, there is no direct world. The world is always something that one constructs, and one constructs it in a fashion that not only satisfies one's needs, but makes one get on with other people along the way. The field of cognitive psychology is rooted in the genetic epistemology of Swiss psychologist Jean Piaget, who perceived that school children go through similar stages of cognitive development. As infants, basic sensory motor skills, or schema, direct exploration that produce knowledge through the process of assimilation. The child then tries to accommodate these schema to new objects or events. Assimilation and accommodation form the method of learning, or what Piaget called adaptation. Cognitive psychology very quickly leads you out of psychology into other fields as well, which then leads one to the very interesting question of to what extent is psychology ever a self-sufficient field? Uh, can it ever exist in its isolated way with its well-known paradigms, which is supposed to relate to things? Can it neglect the changing cultural patterns? And the answer is no, it can't. Uh, but on the other hand, it can take a closer look at the way those institutions work. On September 13, 1848, outside the small town of Cavendish, Vermont, railroad construction worker Phineas Gage was setting explosive charges when a tamping iron was blown through his head with such force that it landed almost 30 yards behind him. Whereas previously he had been hardworking, responsible, and popular with the men in his charge, his personality was changed from the accident. His doctor reported that his mind was radically changed, so decidedly that his friends and acquaintances said he was no longer Gage. Some studies of people on death row who are the, the type of, of person who are very explosive and they've murdered a few people in this, seem to have an impairment of the frontal lobes. That seems to be an area of the brain that regulates behavior, that puts sort of a damper on explosive behavior. So if you've got an impairment in that area, you may not have control. Gage's case is cited as some of the first evidence, the damage to the brain could alter aspects of personality and behavior, leading us to today's rapidly growing field of neuroscience. One of the, the rural exciting directions of psychology is a health psychology focus, where the field is starting to realize the importance of biological mechanisms, uh, psychological mechanisms, uh, uh, cultural mechanisms, and, and how they are all interrelated and, and affect the uh, well-being of the organism and the uh, end result of how that organism interacts in their environment. For the past 3,000 years, some of the world's greatest thinkers have dedicated themselves to understanding how the mind works in conjunction with the body and to developing methods of helping people change their attitudes and behavior, such to experience a better, fuller, or richer life. However, therapy has proven to be hard work. Changing behavior patterns and altering the way one views himself in the world is not easy. If only there was a panacea. Enter the exciting world of psychopharmacology, where, like in Aldous Huxley's Brave New World, fears, worries, and anxieties can all be dismissed with the ingestion of a simple little pill. Psychopharmacology works because the brain is a biochemical machine that generates thoughts, feelings, attitudes, and beliefs. Change the biochemistry and presto, you change the way you think and feel. Today, hundreds of millions of people around the world have balanced their moods and found a better life by using tablets with names like Valium, Ritalin, Prozac, Xanax, and even Soma, the name of the drug in Huxley's epic tale of futuristic societal conformity.